So I'll now introduce our speaker for today, which is me. <laughs> I, I'm Ajahn <Ajabra. laughs> And this is uh, supposed to be a day of mindfulness, which has a big uh, reputation in our modern world, but you want to take it much further than it's been before. So some of the stuff which uh, I am going to be teaching today is cutting edge, ahead of the curve. Uh, because I teach other people how to do these things and then they go and take all the lessons which I teach them and then they start up their businesses and charge others for it. And I, <laughs> they don't give me any commission, <laughs> even though much of it started from a monk like me. But anyway, uh, how many of you are actually in, um, actually see what you do, how many are like in caring professions like nurses, psychologists, doctors? What do the rest of you do? Nothing really. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Just like me. <laughs> but can you really do nothing? Because part of uh, mindfulness is learning how to do nothing. Because when you start to be aware of your body and of your mind, now you start to feel just how much you keep doing and how you can't just stop doing things. And this is one of the reasons which drives people crazy which makes them have really bad health, emotional and physical. We literally start thinking too much. A little bit of mindfulness can actually stop that. Now the first little lesson, because if anyone tries any mindfulness, any meditation, one of the most difficult things which people always complain about is they can't stop thinking. Think, 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 think. And there is a very nice way of understanding just how to transcend the thoughts. And to understand what I am talking about, you do a little simile first of all. Uh, I don't know how many of you like movies. And when you're watching a movie, do you get excited in a movie? Do you get sad in a movie? How many of you have cried you know, when something sad happens in a movie? And why do you do that? Look, I'm getting old now, and so one of the movies I remember you know, over 40 years ago, you know, was, uh, you know, does anyone remember West Side Story, the movie? There's really, <laughs> okay, you're getting old like me. <laughs> now this was actually a, just a base, a very uh, smart movie based on basically Romeo and Juliet, but set in, a, set in the west side of New York. And in the end of the movie, it was like two lovers from opposite sides of the cultural divide there was Maria, you know, she was from, uh, I think, a Puerto Rican family, and Tony from uh, Italian migrants, and they weren't allowed to really go out with each other or get married. But, you know, it was one of those loves which no one could stop, which was doomed from the start, and things happened. And in the end, Maria's brother was trying to find Tony to shoot him, and Maria was trying to warn the love of her life, Tony, that he was in big danger. And searching through the streets of New York, she finally found Tony uh, under one of the street lamps, the old lamp posts. And when she warned Tony, be careful, it was too late because her brother found him at the same time. And a shot rang out in the dark and hit poor Tony. And there with blood coming from his chest, Maria ran towards him took him in her arms as he was dying, a doomed love. And I don't know how this could happen, but late at night in the streets of New York, an orchestra started playing. <laughs> <laughs> and they had this song, there's a place for us, somewhere a place for us, as Tony was dying in her arms. And I went there with my girlfriend. This was many years ago, I'm a monk now. Uh, <laughs> and my girlfriend started crying and crying and crying. And I couldn't believe, what are you crying for? Tony's dying, he's not. He'd be reincarnated in the next showing of the movie. <laughs> it's only a movie. But she was totally engrossed in it and emotional. She got caught up in the narrative. Now it's not girls who do this, guys do this even worse. If ever you are watching them as they look at, a, say, a, 
a soccer match on TV. <laughs> Come on, shoot the ball! Offside! That was a goal! And they're shouting at a TV set. <laughs> and the match is being played somewhere in England. Doesn't matter how loud you shout in Hong Kong, it will not be <laughs> heard in England. So why do people actually do that and they start shouting at a TV set at, a, say, a, a sports game? And the reason is, is because when you watch, say, a sports match or a good movie, you literally get sucked into the screen. That if you were aware enough, you know, that your mind is almost telling you that you're actually right there on the streets of New York when Tony's being shot. That you're right there on the, in the football ground somewhere in Europe as a game is being played. You get the perception you're right involved, and that is why you get caught up in these things. And with uh, a little bit of uh, imagination, if you have got a strain of thought going in your mind and you want to calm it down and be free from that thought, imagine that those thoughts are being played out on a screen. And you are sitting behind, back, maybe two or, three, two or three foot away from the screen. The thoughts are out here and you, the observer, are watching it from a distance. Then you find it's not that hard to let it go. When you watch from a distance, it actually looks ridiculous. When you don't get caught up in the soccer match, it's just a soccer match for goodness sake. You know, sometimes your team wins, sometimes the other team wins. And it's just, no, just a sports match, that's all. A movie, it's not real. So when you actually put it from a distance, you find you can get much better perspective. You don't get so caught up, which means you have more control, more freedom to let it go if you really feel you need to. Some years ago, I was on an aircraft and they were playing a movie. I didn't take the headphones. And this movie, I remember, was called Armageddon. Do you remember that movie? Now for me, they just the screen came down and I was just looking at it without the, the sound. Now try that next time you watch a sports match or watch a movie. Turn the sound completely off and you get a totally different experience. For me, I remember in Armageddon, I think there was, who was it, Bruce Willis or something and somebody else, they were saving the world. Now as soon as I could figure out the plot, I knew the world would be saved but only at the last minute. And it'd be really touch and go, because you knew the plot as soon as you, you, know, you started st watching this movie. And there was a part of the movie where they sent two spacecraft up to see this, was it meteor or comet, which was about to hit the Earth. And I forget who the other hero was, the other guy, but apparently his uh, spacecraft smashed into the comet. And there were sparks and booms and bangs all over the place. And that was went on for about three or four minutes. And then it rolled down this huge cliff for more smashes and bangs and explosions. It went on for about ten minutes. Now, if only about 30 seconds of that happened to a normal person, you'll be toast. You'll be dead. There will be no remains left of you. But in this movie, everything went quiet. And then this hand appeared, and the hero pulled himself up. His hair was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> there, was, there was not even a bead of sweat or a bit of um, carbon on his face. He was <laughs> and as soon as I saw this, I burst out laughing. It was the funniest movie I'd ever seen. <laughs> and I looked around all the other passengers. Oh, he's safe. <laughs> Now the reason I say this is because this is what happens with your thoughts. Why is it we get caught up in these, what are really silly thoughts? They don't get anywhere, they don't prove anything. They're not going to sort of uh, solve your problems. We get caught up in it because we actually put our mind right in the center of the action. And all we really need to do is to stand back and see these things and you find that it's not such a big thing. It's easy to let it go. Or, in a simile I've been saying for years, which is now uh, part of a psychologist's uh, therapy. The main reason he's teaching, why he's making a lot of money in Sydney. He got this from me again. 
how big is the human hand? How big is my hand? You know, now my hand is so big, I can't see any of you. I can't see the sunrise, the sunsets, the birds, the mountains, the ocean, the stars at night. I can't see anything. All I can see is my hand. Is it the fact my hand is too big? No, a hand is a hand. The problem is I'm so close to my hand, I'm right into it, which means I can't see anything else. I've got no perspective. When I put my hand where it belongs, at the end of my arm, my hand hasn't changed its size. But now I've got perspective. Now I can see my hand, but I can see each one of you as well. And I can see the trees and the flowers and the traffic in the background. I can see much more when I get the perspective. So part of mindfulness training is getting perspective. Being able to see the problems of your life and other people's lives and put them where they belong at the end of the arm. You can see the problems, but you can also see much more about life as well. You don't get so sucked in. If you There's an interesting thing as well, which I've noticed. Uh, I'm going to save you a lot of money now. So, I don't know how many of you have got these big TV screens in your house. You don't need those. They're very expensive. And the only time you will ever notice how big your TV screen is, is when it's not switched on. Because as soon as you switch it on, you actually, your mind gets sucked into the screen and just fits perfectly inside the screen. If you don't believe me, the next time you go on Cathay Pacific or Singapore Airlines, whatever else your airline you travel, they have these very small screens on the back in economy class. You will find the experience of watching a movie on those small screens is no different than the experience you have on the big screens. And literally, your mind just fits inside the screens and you're not aware of the edges of the screen you're just aware of the content. It doesn't matter how big the screen is. So all these huge screens are a total fraud. Wasting your money. Just get a tiny screen and you find once you sort of uh, start watching, it appears the experience, the mental experience is precisely the same as if it was a big screen. Check it out the next time you go on an aircraft and watch these small screens. Now the reason is again because your mind fits inside whatever you know the screen is and just sees what's in the center. So what we're doing here is learning how just the way that our perception works. And when we get caught up in something, we are literally means our mind is right inside there. I also remember watching these horror movies. Uh, I remember as a student, uh, one of the movies I remember watching was Tarantula. And there you were in the, f in the movie theater, and sure enough, when Tarantula, this monster, it was a small spider, who actually got caught up in a nuclear explosion and became a monster, a mutant tarantula. You know how stupid these movies are. But anyway, <laughs> he was <laughs> creeping behind somebody. And of course, somebody in the audience, they always used to this, hey, look out behind you! They shouted at the screen. They get caught up inside of it. Now this is, I mean, the reason I'm saying this is because this is why our thoughts control us rather than we can stand back and, as it were, control the thoughts. When we step back, then we can let them go. We can choose whether it's a nice thought, we can go with it if we want to. If it's a ro rotten thought, we can just let it go. Simply because we are not caught up in the movie of your thoughts. So what this is actually doing is looking at things with a different perspective. And this is really important in our life because it's the thoughts which drive us crazy. It's the thoughts which make us angry. It's the thoughts which give us one perspective on our life, another person, our problems, whatever it is, which means we have no perspective anymore. And that's what, what drives a lot of people absolutely mad and crazy. And also gives them bad health. Uh, an example of this. It's uh, how many people are uh, psychiatrists or work in the field of psychiatry and mental illness? No one here, okay. Well, it doesn't matter, it's a good simile anyway. Some years ago, I was invited to give a keynote address at the Institute of Mental Health in Singapore, a huge campus where everybody who has any sort of mental illness uh, will go to this one, they call it one-stop shop. You know, just Singapore is trying to sort of... Uh, use marketing to get a hub for the whole of Asia. You know, hubs, one-stop shops, you know what I'm talking about, marketing. <laughs> so 
So anyway, I went there and gave a little talk. And after the talk, this gentleman came up to me afterwards and thanked me for my presentation. And uh, I asked him afterwards, well, what, what do you do at this Institute of Mental Health? And he told me he was a professor of schizophrenia. And so the next question was, well, how do you treat schizophrenia in Singapore? And then what he said next just really just impressed me so much. He said, just as you've been explaining in your talks, he said, I don't treat schizophrenia in the schizophrenic unit in Singapore. I don't treat schizophrenia. I treat the other part of the patient. And when I heard that, I thought, wow, somebody has understood the psychology of the human mind. You don't treat the schizophrenia, you treat the other part. If you have a garden, if you water the weeds, what grows? The weeds. You water the flowers, what grows? The flowers. Whatever you pay attention to, that is what grows. So in this particular case, now he could stand back enough to see this wasn't a person who was a schizophrenic, it was a person who suffered episodes of schizophrenia. And it's a totally different ball game. Uh, the story which I had given earlier, which uh, had prompted this man, so actually to say, just as I taught, you know, he didn't teach schizophrenia, was the anecdotes which I had of going into to prisons in Australia, Singapore, in Europe, throughout the world, going into prisons you know, to teach. Interestingly, you know the first time I taught meditation in a prison, there was a prison in Australia, and there was a, so not a big prison, there was about 110 inmates in the prison, and about 105 of those inmates turned up to my meditation class. That's how popular it was. The five who couldn't come, they were busy, they were, had to do, go to the hospital or do something there, they weren't free, but everyone who was free came to learn meditation from me. And as I was teaching the meditation technique, after five minutes, one of the prisoners, this huge guy, stood up, put his hand up, and said, can I ask a question? Now, if you're in a prison, and if a big guy like that interrupts you, you say, yes, please, ask. <laughs> <laughs> and the question he asks, and the, uh, you can't make this up, real life is more funny than any joke which is created by anybody. He asked me, he said, is it really true that through meditation you can learn how to levitate and fly over walls? <laughs> 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 that, this happened. And then I realized why all the prisoners had come to learn <laughs> meditation. <laughs> when, I t when I told them, yeah, to escape, when I told them, it's really, really, really rare that anyone can levitate like that. The next time I went to teach, only three people <laughs> turned up. <laughs> That's what happens. But every time I went into prison, I never saw a criminal. I never saw a rapist, a thief, a murderer. I never saw a fraudster. I saw many people who committed crimes. I'd seen people who had murdered, people who had raped, but I never saw a rapist. If you understand what I'm talking about there, you understand why this person never tra treated schizophrenia, he treated the other part of the patient. Because when you look at a person, and you really are mindful, you are really aware of the true story, not just part of it, not just their crime, not just their illness, but the bigger picture. You see, there is no such, such thing as a criminal. There's a person, a human being has done so much else in his life or her life, many really beautiful, good things, wonderful things. They've also done some terrible acts. But those terrible acts don't define them. They don't confine them. They're more than that. You know what happens when you are going to visit a prison, or you are treating someone with a sickness, or with someone with a disability. It's so easy to see the disability, the sickness, the fault, and think that's all that they are. You're just looking at the hand and not seeing the rest of them. They're a terrorist. There is no such thing as a terrorist. There is people who have committed terrorist acts. 
Now, when you see that difference, that opens up a huge area of therapy. For me, when I saw in these people in jail who done terrible acts, really hurt, you know, kill people. You don't just kill one person. You know, you kill the lives and the happiness and the dreams of so many other people who love them and know them. It's a really a bad thing. You rape a girl, and my goodness, you know, she is wounded for life. It's not an easy thing to overcome. So you've done terrible things, but it doesn't mean you're a terrible person. And when I saw the other part of that person, I could see something I could respect. And that was actually quite surprising for many people in prison. In prison you have to wear prison clothes. You know, you're in the prison cell. Everything is telling you about your crime you committed. Nothing ever tells you about the other part of you. So when someone like me comes in there, and they realize there's more to them, much more than the terrible act they did, then they can become aware of the other part of them. And as they become aware of the other part of them, they start to get self-respect. Which means they are worth something. Which means that when their sentence is finished, they never go back again. And that was one little compliment I've got. One of the compliments which I've cherished probably one of the best compliments I've ever got. When a prison officer in Australia gave a call to my monastery and I was past the phone and they said, Ajahn Brahm, can you please come back to teach in our jail? My reply was, I'm sorry sir, but I'm too busy. I have to go to Hong Kong, to San Francisco, all these other places. They won't let me be free. And he said, and I said, I'll send somebody else. And the prison officer says, no, I want you. And of course, the next question is the obvious one, why me? And he said he'd been in the prison service all his life. He was soon to retire. In all those 30, 40 years, he'd noticed something very unique. That all the people who came to my classes, when they left jail and when the centers had finished, never ever returned. And that really meant something to me. You've done something. You've healed somebody. They've done their punishment, now they have a life to live and to make up for the bad things they've done. But they can't make up for the bad things they've done when they're still in jail. And it worked. And that's exactly why this person who was a professor of schizophrenia, why he understood there's more to a person than a schizophrenia. If that's all you ever see, if that's all you're ever mindful of, then that's all they'll ever show you. That's all they'll ever become. Before I was a monk, I used to be a school teacher in a high school. That's one of the reasons why I became a monk. <laughs> Teaching teenagers all day is enough to make anyone tear their hair out <laughs> <laughs> and think of leaving the world. <laughs> That's only a joke. I really enjoyed being a teacher. But you know, part of being a teacher, you had to do a little bit of educational psychology. And there was this one very, very famous piece of social experiment which was done. Which, you know, I remember this, and it changed a lot of the way I looked at life. There were two classes in a high school in UK somewhere. You know, not in important years, maybe 12, 13 year olds or something around that. Now, a bit of a way from O levels, but still, you know, they're in high school. There were two classes of about 30 kids each. And at the end of the school year, as people did at that time, they gave them an exam in order to grade them for the years to come. Now, usually, you know, after giving an exam, they publish the results, give out prizes. And usually the top 30, the top half go in one class and the bottom half go in the other class. But this year they decided to do something different. And they kept it a total secret, only the principal and the two psychologists understood what was going on. Because when they marked all the papers and they had the exam results, the child who came top first 
was allocated in the same class as the child who came fourth and fifth, eighth and ninth, twelfth and thirteenth, sixteenth and seventeenth. They all went in one class. The children who came second and third, sixth and seventh, tenth and eleventh, and so on, went in the other class. In other words, they split the kids up equally based on the results of those exams. And the principal went to great lengths to choose teachers she thought were equally competent, classes with equal facilities. They made everything as equal as possible except for one thing. They called one of those classes Class A and the other one Class B. <laughs> now imagine what happens. Now your kid hasn't been doing anything all year, always getting bottom marks, and your kid gets in class A. Well done, son. I didn't have any faith or trust in you, but you did really well. You know, have a new sort of video game or whatever. And other kids, you know, you went in class B. But dad, I was doing well. Doesn't matter, no more privileges. You have to do extra homework, extra tutorial. Because even the parents thought class A were the top half from the year before. And the class B were the ones who were the worst. And because the principal never told the teachers, the teachers are the same. They taught class A at a higher level than class B. And even the children's own belief in themselves, oh, I'm class B. I'm class A. That was enough that one year later, when they gave the end of the year examination, the results were chilling. The children in class A, even though they were equal from the time before, did so much better than the children in class B, exactly as you would have expected if they had have been the top 50% from the year before. And the children in class B did so badly as if they were the bottom half. After 12 months, class A kids became class A. Class B kids became class B. We lived up to our expectations. Now, when you're mindful of just your expectations, who you think you are, what you think you can do, imagine a person who thinks they're a criminal. After a while, they become a criminal. A person who has a mental disease. You've got OCD. After a while, you get OCD. That's obsessive compulsive disorder. That's one of the reasons why we should be really, really mindful, very careful of putting these labels on people. If they don't fit when you first give it to them, they will fit later on. People will live up and become what you expect of them. That's one of the other reasons why you women never ever call your husband stupid. <laughs> if you call him stupid too many times, he becomes stupid. <laughs> Now, there's actually there's more to that than a joke, okay? This is what happens. So a lot of mindfulness is actually not just being aware of the body, but also being aware that your mind works, the way the thoughts work. And so what happens in this great generator of your life inside of you? Now, once you start to become aware of this, it's amazing just how much wisdom and insight you can get. And this is not just theories. This is actually what changes people's lives. So we're trying to become aware. And the only way we can become aware is, again, just be a bit separated. And another little simile for you, before I actually do some more practical stuff. This is just the introduction. This is just to, you know, to whet your appetite of what's coming today, to make it interesting. That uh, when I was 18, I went to the United States, bought out of my skull, just the same as any other place. And I picked up some books from a library about the jungles in the Yucatan Peninsula, in Guatemala and, and the very, very, very south uh, east of Mexico. Because in these jungles, there was an ancient civilization called the Mayans. And they built all these incredible pyramids in the middle of the, jun of the jungle. Even before the the uh, Spanish came, the whole civilization had disappeared and no one knew why. 
and they had these huge temple complexes with, ju with pyramids in the jungle and no one knew why. And I thought it would be really cool to go and seize these places. And so this was in 1969. It took a lot of effort to get to those places. I was literally had to get on a fishing boat up the Caribbean coast and down this river, you know, seeing uh, Indians literally in dugout canoes, totally naked, coming the opposite direction. Any moment I expected Tarzan to come swinging through the trees. That's what it was like, you know, it was this really, really indigenous ancient rainforest, hadn't changed at all. And on the back of trucks going through these windy jungle paths, up mountains, down ravines, very dangerous but really great fun, an adventure. It took me about three or four days to get from Guatemala City to this middle of this temple complex. And because there was hardly anybody, actually the only person I saw there was an archaeologist who was digging away. He didn't mind me. These were the days when you could wander around anywhere. You didn't have to buy a ticket. There was no one else there. There was no coffee shops, no place you could get any sort of souvenirs. You could just walk around and do whatever you want. It was dangerous because many people went there to loot the place. But I wasn't into looting anything. I saw these big monuments in the middle of the jungle, these big pyramids. Now remember, I was a boy, 18 years of age, you see these big pyramids, and what do you do? Climb up them. <laughs> Why? It's just a boy thing. <laughs> what do you do that for? You know, girls would just probably sit there and chat. Boys have to climb up it. It's interesting psychology. Why boys have to do that? <laughs> anyway, so I climbed up. It's a long way up. I went, but it was really worthwhile, because when I got up to the top of the pyramid, and I had a great understanding of why these pyramids were built, what their meaning was. And it wasn't anything sort of psychic or magic, it was just common sense. Because I'd been three or four days traveling in the jungle, in real rainforest. If ever you go into real rainforest, you'll find if they do make any path through the jungle, it very quickly is covered over with vines and, and uh, tree branches, because the rainforest has got so much life in it, it regenerates almost immediately. And so I realized on the top of that pyramid, for three or four days, I had been traveling in, in tunnels, tunnels through the jungle. You know, you looked up and it was covered with, with trees or vines. You would never see far distances, because you have a wall of green and brown trees and wood on either side of the narrow road, even in the rivers, they were all covered over. So for three or four days, I'd been traveling through tunnels, and I'd never seen the sky, nor the horizon. And now I got to the top of this pyramid, and it was just above the tree line. And for the first time in three or four days, I could see the horizon infinity in all directions, with nothing between me and the infinite. And I could look down, it was like Google Maps. I could see the path which it took hours to come along. I could see in the distance the town where I'd slept the night before. It was like Google Maps, you could see the whole layout of the place in which you were traveling. And of course, it became quite clear the meaning of this. Sometimes we have to get out of the jungle, above and beyond, to get the bird's eye view of our life and our place in it and where we belong. That is mindfulness, be able to stand back and see clearly what's really going on. And I could imagine what it would have been like for a young man or a young woman, maybe going through some rite of passage, 18, 19, 20, I don't know, and being led up that pyramid for the first time. This would be someone born in the jungle, <laughs> brought up there all their life. This is their, their, their life, their area, their home, their play, where they play and where they uh, enjoy themselves, where they hunt. For the first time, they can get above the jungle and they see it all. They see the relationships and how things are connected together. And of course, the most lovely thing, to see the infinite in all directions with nothing, no religion, no priest, no monk, no sifu between you and the infinite in all directions. That would be mind-blowing for these young people. For me it was big enough, 
and I'd only been three or four days in the jungle. These have been kids or young people all their life in the jungle. Now that simile is a very beautiful one about what mindfulness really does. It takes you away and out so you can at last see what really is going on. You're not covered by the jungle with all its vines and, and trees and leaves and stuff. It's out there. That you can see the jungle. You can see everything that surrounds it. What's beyond the jungle? And I think you understand what I'm talking about here because people's lives today are very much like living in a jungle. You know, it's really tough living. It's like you've got a machete and you're hacking your way through your life. Really difficult and you get so tired hacking your way just through one day is stressful enough. And now you can actually see what you're really doing. You leave the jungle for a while, see from a distance, that is a bit of awareness. So, how we actually learn how to do this, to let the jungle, go outside the jungle, to, you know, to find some space between you and the thoughts. We have all these practices, and these practices are called mindfulness practices, meditation practices, whatever you wish to call them. First of all, in order to get away from the jungle of your thoughts, because that's what most people believe in. You believe in your thoughts. But I think you should all know that thoughts are the labels. Here is a little, uh, another little story which makes this very, very clear. This is, comes from um, my favorite story from Lao Tzu, the Taoist master. He, when he was alive centuries ago, uh, in his little monastery, or whatever it was called in those days, he would always go on a walk in the evening and would allow one of his disciples, one of his students, to accompany him on a walk. But there was a golden rule. If you went on a walk with the master, you had to be silent. You weren't allowed to speak, not even one word. And one day, a young student was uh, asked to go on a walk with the master and was accepted. And when they went for a walk through the forest, through the mountain, uh, they came to a ridge in the mountains, a sunset. And it was this beautiful sunset, you know, the streaks of gold and orange and purple just along the horizon. It was amazing. And the student, he forgot the rule, and he said, Wow, what a beautiful sunset. At which the master turned around and walked back. The student had broken the rule. He'd spoken. And when they got back to the monastery, Lao Tzu said, this young man is forbidden from going on a walk with me ever again throughout his whole life. And when this young man's friends tried to, to help him, say, look, they're banning for six months or a year, but not for life, that's a bit too much. And anyway, what's wrong with saying what a beautiful sunset? And that is where this great master said, and this is when I heard this, this opened up lots and lots of of ways of looking at the world, which I'd never seen before. He said, when my students said, what a beautiful sunset, he wasn't watching the sunset anymore. He was only watching the words. There's a lot of difference there. When you live in the world of thought, you can't see a sunset. All you see is the word sunset. What a beautiful sunset, the thought, rather than the experience. Or, as I say these days, to make it gross and to make you laugh, it's like going to the toilet. You go to the toilet here because you need to sort of let go, and you see the sign, women's toilet, on the door. So you pee on the door. Well, it says women's toilet. That's what it says. <laughs> The sign is not the toilet. The sign is pointing. The toilet's the other side of the door, stupid. But how many people mistake the sign for the thing in itself? It's like peeing on the door instead of going inside. Now, that's the same as seeing the sunset or seeing the word, the sign for sunset. So a lot of mindfulness training is getting beyond the thoughts to the thing the thoughts are supposed to be describing. 
In order to do this, because each one of you probably have been totally screwed up by Western education, giving everything a name, ever since you went to grade one at school, and the teacher pointed out, man, woman, house, cow, dog, cat. And from that time on, you could not see a cat anymore without the name. How often is it you do have pets at home, you give them names? What do you give them a name for? Can't they just be this being without a name? The being is much different than the name. For example, who are you? Your name? Does that describe you? Here is a little exercise. I enjoy doing this, just to make the point of being mindful beyond the thoughts. What is this which I'm holding up? Any idea? Please shout out what this is. Stick? Yeah, what else? Mallet? Anything else? Describe it. What do you see? What is this? Wood? Yeah, what else? Yeah, what else? This is an exercise. You can do this with clients, with friends, whatever. You say stick, you say cylindrical, you can say brown, you can even describe its size and length. But when you run out of descriptions, then you can actually start to see it for what it is. It's much more than a stick or a banger or a bonger or a mallet. It's much more than that. Trouble is, that in our modern society, we are only mindful of the names of things. We can't see beyond that. This is one of the reasons why we get stuck, we're not wise anymore. So who are you? <laughs> you tell me your name, your gender, tell me your age, your profession. Is that you? No way. You're far more than that. But when we get stuck in our thoughts, you are, or the person says, I am a rapist. You are a terrorist. You are a guy. <laughs> you are Chinese. You are quite low. You are <laughs> 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 I love that word. <laughs> so this is not what people are. These are just names, for goodness sake. So in mindfulness, we go way beyond that. Now, the way we go beyond that is, first of all, is to go to to places, to be mindful of things which haven't got names. A lot of times, if you ever go to these mindfulness classes, sometimes they go along and they give everybody just a, like a raisin to suck or something. Have you ever done that in these mindfulness classes? These are the classes you have to pay a lot of money for. Here you get it for free and much better. So they give everybody a raisin each to suck. The reason they do this is number one, raisins are cheap and you can give lots of them out to everybody. And number one, you're going to taste. Because when you taste something, we haven't got much of vocabulary for taste. And when we get sweet, but it's much more than that. So what you're going to, you're going to physical experience of stuff which hasn't got names anymore. You're getting to a deeper level of reality. You're becoming aware of the world underneath the thoughts. It's the same way if you had an opportunity to have a walk and listen to the sound of the birds in the early morning. Can you give them names? If you're this unfortunate ornithologist who know all the calls and so give all the names of the birds, you miss it. You know, I went to Cambridge where I studied and I, I loved astronomy. I learned all the names of a lot, a lot of the names of the stars and the constellations. And then when I would look at the stars at night, all I would see were names. Honestly, I had to unlearn, deliberately forget all of those names I'd learned so I could see the beauty of the stars at night. You don't need the names to see the beauty. You can see the, the leaves on the trees. They're beautiful, you don't need the names. So this is learning how to be observant, to be mindful, without any names. And sometimes, if you can't sort of hear the sound of birds, at least we can feel sensations in our body. 
So from right now, can you be aware of the feeling of your bottom pressed against a chair or against the cushion? Can you name that? <laughs> we haven't developed a vocabulary for bum feelings. <laughs> which is great, which means you can feel it instead of naming it. And when you can start to feel it, this is the start of being mindful of a world way beyond your thoughts. You can actually be alert and aware. And this is where we start many mindfulness trainings, by being aware of feelings in the body. And a little while later, how long am I going? Where's the no clocks here? I should get a, oh actually I've got one in my pocket here. Because I was here last year and I didn't know what the hell the time was, so this time I've got a clock. So, when you are aware of feelings, you can find you go beyond thoughts. And it's a very wonderful world. And we're going to do a bit of an experiment in a moment. I'm going to get you to do some mindfulness training, which is called body sweeping. And body sweeping, sorry, we start by opening up the clock. <laughs> here we go. Oh wow. So we're going to start by just being aware of our toes and little by little we move our awareness up our body so we can actually feel all these incredible different parts of our body until we get to the head. And you find because you're f you don't need to change your posture, people get very excited when we're going to do something instead of listening to me. <laughs> what we're going to do, we're going to be able to feel our body little brother, I'm going to guide you all the way through. And you're going to be aware of places in your body maybe you haven't been aware of, maybe even ever, or certainly for a long time. You're going to really become to feel your body. At the same time, I'm going to teach you how to relax your body, which makes it really pleasant. And this is a way you can understand how you can be aware, way beyond your thoughts, and it's incredibly pleasant, it is gives you so much understanding and wisdom and it is actually incredibly healthy for you. You can heal incredible diseases. I teach this to people with breast cancer and they're really excited because that's a huge problem for many women and it works. I've been going to our local cancer group this year apparently 25 years I've been teaching them and they invite me back every year because it works. This is great stuff. Okay? So get yourselves comfortable, however comfortable you can get. You know, if you really, okay, let's, you can follow me because some of you are getting to be my age. Get up and stretch. <laughs> You'll be sitting down for too long. Oh, yeah. Do you? <laughs> Very good. And when you're ready, please sit down. Very good. And make yourself as comfortable as you can. You think you're comfortable? Haha, <laughs> you ain't seen nothing yet. Just with comfort. So close your eyes. With your eyes closed, you can become more aware, more mindful of your body when not so much of your brain is taken up by seeing. You've got more space to feel. So feel your body, and if you need to move your body to make it more comfortable, please do so. This is going to last about 30 minutes, maybe 25. So get yourself as comfortable as possible. Now, see if you can notice, still with your eyes closed, any sensations, any feelings in your toes? What's going on down there? If you can't get any feeling in your toes, wiggle them. 
or press them against something so you can actually feel sensations there. We call this making contact, being mindful of feelings in one part of your body, just your toes. Once you have awareness of one part of your body, you may begin to notice that that feeling changes. Now use a bit of trial and error to find out what you need to do to make that feeling in your toes become more comfortable. Just imagine taking off pressure, releasing tensions. Relax your toes. The real trick is a little bit of kindness, of softness, of letting your toes just be. And then you can imagine as if your toes are expanding, relaxing, soothing. And your awareness shows you that you have, even if only a small amount, relaxed your toes. Now move your awareness, your mindfulness, to your feet. Can you notice any sensation in your feet right now? Any feeling or sensation will do. You don't need to give it a name, just know there's a feeling or sensation somewhere in my feet. You've made contact with your mind and your feet. That allows you to have feedback. Now see how you can relax your own feet, the feeling sensations there. So you're holding nothing tight. Everything is loosened up, there's no pressure, no pulling or pushing or squashing. You're being aware of your own feet and the feelings there and relaxing them, bringing them to a state of comfort and ease. For me, I, it's like a tingling feeling, like when you just had a foot massage and everything is just so relaxed, so at ease, as you relax your own feet. And then you move up the body to your calves, huge area of muscle or skin or bones. Can you notice any sensations or feelings anywhere in the part of your body, below your knee, above your feet? Once you've established contact there, then you have the ability to have the feedback of mindfulness. So wish, will your legs, your lower legs, to relax. You can notice all these sensations there. And just observe them getting softer, pressures being undone. Imagine some of those tendons or muscles have been pulled and now you release both ends so they can become loose and natural and free. Can you notice those feeling sensations in your lower legs? Because once you can be mindful of those feelings, you will soon learn how to relax them. until your lower legs get very, very comfortable. And once it's comfortable enough, I'm rushing through this. Now come up to your knees. Because of sports injuries or other accidents, people have a lot of injuries to their knees. This is one way to heal them. Can you notice any feeling or sensation in that part of your body, above your lower legs, below your thighs, your knees? It's not that hard to be aware. 
And once you're well aware, you can get that feedback. You know what is necessary, what needs to be done to make those sensations and feelings closer to comfort, to be more relaxed, more open, less tension. The knees start to relax. Your mindfulness tells you that. Just staying with your knees a bit longer. Relaxing to the max. And then move your awareness up to your thighs, your upper legs. There's so much muscle and stuff there, it's easy to be aware. So can you notice anything in your upper legs? Once you have a feeling that you're aware of, you've made contact, you're mindful. Now see if you can relax that feeling. It's like your thighs are sinking into the softest of cotton cushions. And any tightness is released. Any knots of pain are undone and expanded and freed and loose and easy, relaxed. As you stay being aware of your thighs, and seeing how relaxed you can get that area of your body. Now you can be aware of your whole legs from your thighs down to your toes. Relax, at ease, because you've relaxed them stage by stage. It feels good. Now go to your, your buttocks, pressed against the chair or the cushion. Can you notice that sensation feeling? Again, it's hard to give it a name. But it's amazing that once you're aware of that feeling, you can relax it. Stop holding things tight. Stop controlling. Just let that feeling be. And see if you can experience it relaxing. Relaxing your bottom. It feels quite pleasant. I usually start in the legs and the bottom because now you've got the hang of being mindful and learning how to relax. You're now, now going to a very important part of your body, your torso, where lots of diseases, injuries, pains can very easily establish themselves. So go a couple of inches up from your bottom to your waist. And not just the outside, but the inside, the lower part of your spine, you know, the prostate for the guys, you know, the, <laughs> the lower part of your digestive tract, the colon. There's lots of organs and stuff there which can get irritated and sick. So can you notice any feelings or sensations in the area of your body, around your waist and inside? You are now being mindful of those feelings and sensations. Allows you to have feedback. Now learn how to relax. Very gently will those feelings to get looser. Less tight. Knots of pain or squashed Parts of pain, imagine them expanding, diluting the irritation. Because you get feedback, you try something, the feeling gets worse or it gets better. 
And mindfulness teaches you how to relax the waste and everything inside. Just that air of your body, you're relaxing to the max. It's like someone's gone inside and massaged everything, softly, kindly. And then you move up a couple of inches to the area above your waist, below your chest. So many other organs in there, the kidneys, the liver, the pancreas, maybe the intestines, maybe the upper part of your spine, because many people have these back injuries these days. Can you notice any feeling or sensation in the area below your chest, above your waist? Once you have made contact with that area, you're mindful of that area, you notice the feelings. Please be aware how those feelings change and what you need to do to relax those sensations, to bring them to more state of ease and comfort, to make them Feel at peace, <laughs> calm, healthy. You find that you can, by will, relax the area below your chest, above your waist. Just relaxing it. Until it feels so free and at ease. Now you go a few inches higher to your chest, maybe the stomach, the lungs, the heart, especially for, for women. You have your breasts there, places where cancers can so easily grow. Can you notice any sensation in any of those areas? Thus being aware, being mindful, you can feel that part of your body. And usually any area which is sick, unbalanced, irritated, that's what you become aware of first of all. You notice how those feelings can change. The feedback shows you how to influence those feelings to relax them open out any stress in that part of your body, release any pressures. Because we started with our toes, by the time we get up to here, we've got a bit of uh, ability to be aware and to relax. This is how, ladies, you relax your breasts. Weird as it sounds, you can do it. You can relax your stomach, your lungs. You're aware of the feelings. The feedback teaches you how to relax. And then when you're ready, you go up to your shoulders. There's always tightness and tension there. So you feel any sensations there. You don't need to move. Just know the sensations there. You, break, you establish mindfulness. And just notice how those sensations change, second by second. And what you have to do to relax them. You can relax even your shoulders just by a little bit of good attitude, letting it go, opening out releasing any pressures, taking away fear which creates the pressures in the first place, just being. You find your own shoulders start to feel relaxed. Now you've relaxed your whole torso from the neck down. It feels comfortable. Irritations which may have been there before are gone. 
Now look at your arms, way down from the shoulders to your fingers. Can you notice any sensations in your arms? That's mindfulness. Now see if you can relax your arms and your hands. Just feel them begin to tingle as the feelings and sensations in your arms, you're aware of them and you learn how to just relax everything. So everything gets so loose and free and open. It's like they're just been dangling in warm water at a beach somewhere. And once you've relaxed your arms, go back up to your shoulders, to your neck. Again, that's a place with huge amounts of tension. So it should be very easy to be aware of feelings in your neck or your throat inside, anywhere in that area. Establishing mindfulness in your neck and throat. Just be aware of the feelings, don't try and change them. Establish awareness first. And then learn how to relax those feelings. The mindfulness gives you that feedback. And sometimes just by trial and error, you soon learn how to relax muscles, tendons, stuff in your throat. Opening it out freeing, taking away tightness and tension. With a little bit of practice, it's not that hard to do, to relax. Just one area at a time. And then you move your attention up to your face. People have so much tension in their face. Now can you notice any feelings and sensations, usually around your eyes or your mouth, maybe your nose? As soon as you know those sensations, you've established mindfulness. Now relax your face. The mindfulness gives you that feedback. It teaches you what makes the mind more, t what makes the face more tense, and what relaxes it. What makes it feel free? no tightness or pressure, you're not screwing anything down. Everything is loose and natural in your face, as you're mindful. And it feels good. And once the mindfulness of the face has relaxed you as much as you possibly can, then imagine just going two inches behind your eyes to where your brain is situated. People tell me that there are no feelings and sensations in the brain, but it doesn't matter, by now you can imagine them. Can you notice any feeling which seems to be located in the middle of your brain? Establishing mindfulness, making contact. Now see what you need to do to relax that feeling to relax your own brain until it feels so peaceful, so open, nothing pulling or pushing it, no pressure. The awareness of that feeling allows you to get the feedback. And you soon learn how to relax, even your brain. And now, just be aware of your whole body just sitting here. Relax probably more than when you woke up this morning. Probably more relaxed for than you've experienced for days. And just enjoy the feeling of a relaxed body. 
At the same time, notice you probably had very few thoughts, been aware of sensations in the body, which are totally overwhelmed and pushed aside all your thoughts and worries and concerns. It's one of the reasons why you feel so free. Now you may open your eyes. <sighs> I enjoyed that. <laughs> I don't know about you. <laughs> <laughs> this is incredibly powerful, easy way to bring yourself into good health. That's all these diseases, they come from being too tight somewhere in your body. And you can be relaxed to the max. And I love telling the story about two or three years ago, I had food poisoning, my food poisoning story. Real food poisoning, you know, just, uh, we call that as a monk, an occupational hazard. Because, you know, as a Theravada monk, you feed us and we don't know what you put in the curry or what you put in the food. So sometimes I eat something I shouldn't and it just uh, really hurts. I had this terrible food poisoning and I was in the cave where I stay and I was holding my tummy and just, you know, writhing in pain. Real food poisoning really hurts. We go, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. <laughs> Worse than that. But I'm not a good actor. But there we go. And I was really in a lot of pain. But you know, where, I was, you know, where monks usually live in the forest, it's a long way from doctors. And it's a waste of time calling an ambulance. By the time they get there, you're probably dead. So instead of you know, using that technique, going an ambulance, is, you know, you've got other ways of dealing with these problems. And I use exactly the same technique which I've just taught you. Be aware of this you know, pain in your, your guts, which was almost unbearable, but you can bear anything, just aware of it. And once you're mindful of it, you can actually find out you know, how to relax it. What to do to relax it just a tiny bit, and a tiny bit more. Because I was aware of it, I was getting the feedback. You know, you could see the dials of pain, and you could see you know, when the dials were getting less painful, when they're getting more painful. And little by little, that taught me, because I've been doing this for years, how to relax my intestines. And you know, it, honestly, it took me 20 minutes, that's all, to relax the food poisoning away. It was totally gone. Vanished, never came back again. The pain got less, 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 less until it vanished because I know how to relax. And that was incredible that you can take something which is you know, some bacterial infection and just relax it all away, but it worked. And you know, for afterwards, I, I was trying to figure out how scientifically that could have happened. It happened. I was there. I felt it just totally go. And then, you know, it's sometime later, someone told me that you know, food poisoning is bacteria just messing around with your, your intestinal lining. And I imagine all these bacteria the last time I remember looking at them, they're just blobs with little tentacles going everywhere. And you know, I imagine all these blobs, you know, all those little tentacles were now cross-legged in meditation, being very peaceful and thereby not causing me any trouble. <laughs> I imagine meditating bacteria. <laughs> That's just imagining, but you know, whatever, it worked. So this is actually one of the first little lessons in mindfulness, mindfulness of the body. There's two things, two benefits there. Number one, it uh, is more important than the thought, so you, s you stop thinking about things. And number two, it gives you a, a f understanding, direct experience of your body, what I keep calling feedback. So you learn how to relax your body. With a little bit of practice, you can relax your body so much. If you're having an operation, very easy, just relax your body, no fear, and your body gets really loose. You're playing sport, you know, tense up before a big match, or you're going for some interview, you really get tense, you can learn how to, I can feel the body here, and go relax it, relax it, relax it, to the max. So you don't get the physical tension, which is a counterpart to the emotional problem. And it also means you can relax when you go to bed at night. In fact, that particular method I just taught you, exactly the same, is one of my friends over in Sydney again. 
she started a company called sleeplikeababy.com <laughs> for people around the world with insomnia or other problems in sleeping. And that's precisely what she will teach you for a fee. I'm undercutting the market. But she's made so much money already. You know, she, she said 100% success with insomnia people. Simply because you're relaxing the body, at the same time you're overcoming all these thoughts by feeding the body. You know, it's sensations which don't have names. So all your thoughts of all your problems and difficulties and troubles in life, you're feeding the body instead of obsessing about the problems. You're literally putting the, the hand where it belongs and relaxing the body at the same time. A very, very potent way of learning how to have a good night's sleep. Okay, now I've got another five minutes before I go for lunch and you go for your lunch. Some questions, comments, feedback. I need feedback too, otherwise I don't know whether wasting your time. Did that make sense? Did you feel peaceful and relaxed? How much does it cost these days to go and have like a, a massage at a spa? This is actually better than that. You know one of the reasons why a massage, when they pour hot oil on you and stuff like that, it's because it's bringing you mindfulness to your body. Or someone is touching you and that gives you this beautiful sense of being aware. That costs a lot of money. You can do it for free, anytime you like. That's why when you come here, you know what I usually call this every time I come to this, this how many years I've been coming to this place doing this uh, class? Uh, Fourth Four time. And what do I call this? Club Med, <laughs> Hong Kong University. Club meditation, yeah. Yeah, question. Yeah. Excuse me, I want to ask you something about uh, the um, your meditation and the insomnia because I suffer insomnia for many years and I, I follow you to learn the meditation and I certainly can stop thinking anything and my ethics. Um, until the meditation, I can feel my body just disappear. So I think any pain has been relaxed, but still at that time, my I think my mind is very weak. So mind is very weak. Wonderful. Just uh -huh. but I cannot sleep. Uh, my my mind is very weak. Very weak. So if your mind is very awake, mm -hmm. just lay down there in bed and try your hardest not to go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> because it's just, what is happening there is you're trying to go to sleep, which is why you can't. So I, I, there was, I don't know what it was, maybe three or four years ago, I wasn't sleeping well, and you know how I fixed it up? I, was, I said to myself, look, I'm a monk, I work very hard. This is the most comfortable place, you know, in my whole life, my bed. It's so soft, it's cozy. You know, you're just laying back there. Have you ever woken up in the morning and think, ah, oh, I don't want to get up and go out and go to work? You're just so cozy and warm in the softest, beautiful bed. And you just, I'm gonna, I just want to stay in here for a few more minutes. Because beds are the most comfortable position you could ever have. Especially when you first wake up in the morning. Cozy, warm, you feel really nice. What do you want to waste that feeling for? By going asleep and becoming unconscious. So I decided, no, no, I don't want to go to sleep. I'm going to sit here and enjoy stretching out in my bed, my nice soft pillow, nice and warm under the duvet. Oh, this is cool. This is wonderful. I'm afraid. And then, then what happened? Oh, this is interesting. I'm afraid. And afterwards, what happened? The next thing I knew, I woke up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you afraid of? I'm afraid of getting too exhausted. Ah, no, that's also. Don't worry. You'll just be able to survive. The body is really cool. It's much smarter than you think. You know, if you get exhausted, the body will turn off by itself. <laughs> it's got like automatic pilot. So just you go there, and next time you go to sleep, or try to go to sleep, don't try to go to sleep. Tr get in bed and try to stay awake. <laughs> now honestly, it works. Thanks. Now I'm look at me, I'm just too relaxed now. <laughs> this is my, my, my best meditation posture. <laughs> Relax to the max.
people are so tight, the way they hold their body. You're taught, actually, this is how you should be sitting. Don't be sloppy like me. Sloppy is cool. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and any other questions before we finish off for lunch? Yeah. I just want to say something about the Lao Tzu story yeah. you said before, because that sort of made an impression. Um, what I what I perceived from what you said was that the um, that he when he said, "Oh, what a beautiful sunset," he was inspired. First, he was connected yeah. to it, but then he separated himself from the actual experience by labeling it. Is that what you say is the problem? Uh, no, I think the problem was is. We think about things so much, we put labels on things, and after a while, the label becomes the thing and we miss what's really happening. That's what I was saying. And I have great arguments you know, with how modern psychology and psychiatry by people labeling somebody. You know, as recently, there was this, <laughs> this poor boy, I was in the, over the United States. You know, he had just a kid growing up, 15 or 16, with all the pressures of puberty. And you know he was washing his hands too much, and so the psychologist said, "Oh, that's OCD, obsessional compulsive disorder." And I realised that if that kid believed that, you know he would actually start acting out OCD. And I, you know, I know enough about psychology. I've been around for a long time, and I know the way the mind works. And I say, "Look, I told you, you haven't got OCD. You know, you've been exhibiting some symptoms, but that doesn't make you." OCD boy. The label sometimes becomes a thing. We believe the label so much. We put labels on people. And people live up to it. It's the class A, class B, you know, kid story again. I hear you on the yeah. that the labeling side, yeah. but I'm just still interested in the, the horizon or the sunset. Oh, that's horizon, the because sunset. Because he was so in awe of that. Wow, yeah. isn't that beautiful? No. no? If he said, wow, isn't that beautiful, he wasn't watching the sunset. Wouldn't it's you think that that was still there for him if he's like in awe of it and experiencing yeah. it? I mean, everything can happen simultaneously, no? Yeah, it's usually the, the words come afterwards and the words start dominating. If you want to know what I mean, it's next time you, again, you watch a movie, turn the sound off. If you watch a sort of a sports match, turn the commentary off. Now, you can see what's happening on the sports match. Why do you have to have these people who are telling you, you know, how he shot the ball, he scored a goal. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> so a lot of times the commentaries, sometimes we listen to the commentary. And I've often noticed if you have like a sports match, say, I don't know, who the Hong Kong, say Hong Kong is playing Japan on a soccer match or something. And you turn into the Hong Kong TV channel and then the Japanese TV channel. You find it's a totally different commentary. Because commentary is always biased. It's one step away from the truth. It's one of our problems with speech, with language. It just doesn't ha carry the full message, and it's always a little bit distorted. So it's great to be able to know silently. You can enjoy life much more. And you just look at the stars. You don't say, wow. You don't say, that was Andromeda up there somewhere. You just notice its beauty in silence. So what I'm trying to do here is trying to move people away you know, from this thinking stuff, which causes you so much problems, into just feeling, into smelling. Now, you're going to have your lunch soon. When you have your lunch, a little exercise for you, one spoon at a time, or one morsel at a time. Because, you know, we're using chopsticks or using a spoon or a fork. You know, you notice yourself do this and other people. They've got one morsel in their mouth being chewed, another one on the chopsticks waiting in line. They've already chosen the third one, which is way ahead of themselves. <laughs> so now, to be mindful with your eating. You know, take something on a spoon, you put it in your mouth, taste it as full as you can. Don't give it a name, just feel the, the, the flavor. Until there's no more flavor left, then swallow it. And only then choose the next piece of food. Don't be, if you're thinking of the food you're going to take next, you're not tasting the food in your mouth right now. And that's one of the reasons why people have indigestion. Because they're not tasting the food. 
When you don't taste and enjoy the food, saliva doesn't come out, at least not as much as should be. And don't need to give it a name. Taste it. Mm. So anyway, that's a little exercise for you at lunch. It may, may mean you sort of take much more time at lunch, but it's much more fun. Okay. Now, there may be some questions afterwards. I may, may I haven't answered your question fully. Are there some pieces of paper around so that you can... Sometimes people feel a bit uh, afraid of asking questions in public. So if you have any questions, write them on a piece of paper, leave them here, and I'll answer them after lunch. Or we can prepare some papers, uh, yeah, papers after yeah. lunch. Yeah, and just write them down and put them down there. They're anonymous, although if they are cheeky questions, we can always uh, compare your handwriting with the... A registration forms. <laughs> <laughs> they type it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very good. Okay, so let's have lunch. Okay, thank you, Ajahn. So, dear friends, uh, it's time for lunch. Uh, the lunch uh, boxes are ready outside. So, because uh, Ajahn invite all of us to have a mindful lunch today, so the lunch time will be a bit longer. Please do enjoy your time for eating. So, we'll come back at 1.10. That means one and a half hour for lunch time. So you can actually enjoy your lunch outside or uh, you can have some fresh air outside uh, or maybe on the eighth floor. This is, uh, there is an outdoor rooftop area that you can, it's for public, so you can go there for lunch. So please uh, come back on time at 1.10. Thank you very much.